Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, I was brought up in a Christian home. My earthly father, my father is 90 years old this month. And uh, I can't ever remember a day in my life. Perhaps there were some, but I can't ever remember a day but what my father and my mother gathered us around the family altar. Six of us children gathered us around the family altar and read from God's Word and had prayer with us. And friend, I thank God for a heritage like that. I suppose it was around 18 years ago when my dad was supposed to have been on his deathbed. They called in all the children. And uh, we hung around for a while, but while we were hanging around and going to Duckett Funeral Home and picking out dad's casket, and making arrangements for the funeral. In my heart, I reminded the Lord of how my father had honored his parents. And I said, oh God, if there's any way you can see fit, I want you to give my dad 20 more years. And I just felt in my heart that he was going to do that. And you know my dad, I've heard him testify. He said that I had already crossed over. I was so far over. He said I could see the city. And he said Jesus came out of the city and came out and spoke to me and said, I'm going to send you back. <laughs> he said I'd rather have gone on than to have come back. <laughs> well, that's been about 18 years ago. And you know, I saw my dad not long ago in a revival effort down in South Carolina. And while I was in the service, I mentioned something about my godly parents. And I said, you know, my dad has about three more years to go. I said, he'll be around 92 when the 20 years is up. <laughs> and I said, how many years after that? It's only up to the Lord. But oh, I thank God for my Christian heritage and, and my godly parents and for the home that I had the privilege to be brought up in. And I'm so glad that God has spared my parents to us to be a blessing for, to us and to pray for us down through the years. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Um, I don't know. I... I thought about that great message this morning, and really I would change my direction this afternoon if I hadn't have felt that the Lord had dealt with my heart before that message. I told my daughter after that message this morning, I said, my, and this is a very, very poor comparison, but I said, my. He gave us the whole dog and most of the tail. I said, all I could do is just maybe put a little, little ending on the tail. Then I caught myself and I said, that's a poor comparison. I said, no, what he did, he gave us the whole lamb. <laughs> Amen. He preached from the thought, Behold the Lamb. And already I knew that if I was going to have to preach this afternoon, I'd have to preach from the thought of looking unto Jesus. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Behold the Lamb and looking unto Jesus. Now, I don't know why the Lord is directing his heart and my heart in these areas. Perhaps, uh, perhaps you've been looking around in the wrong direction. But friend, I'm glad this afternoon that we can look unto Jesus. And I've preached along this line in the presence of many of you before, but somehow I felt the Lord challenged our heart with this truth. And I trust you'll pray for us as we try to minister one more time from God's Word. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Hebrews, 
Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And I'm going to talk to us just as quickly as we can move along this afternoon. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. The writer to the book of Hebrews said, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, he had just given us the 11th chapter. He had told us about these great heroes of faith, these great servants of God that have preceded us to the glory world. And friend, think about the thousands, perhaps the millions, that have departed this world to the glory world since that time, from that time until this. And think about it this afternoon. Some of us have loved ones. I mean, we have those that have already departed and and we know, we know they're in that world over there. They're already in the glory world. They're in the grandstands of heaven. They're in that great arena up there. They're, they're in God's hall of fame. And I don't know about you, but I believe that great crowd on the other side over there is pulling for us. I don't know how many times when we've won a victory. I mean, when we won a victory over sin and over temptation and over the devil, I don't know how many times they may have arisen to their feet, feet and given, given ovation after ovation. They're pulling for us. They want us to make it. He said, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, everything that would hinder us, and the sin, let us go on into holiness, the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Actually, he's saying to us that if we have, well, if we just, if we don't have scars on us, if we cannot testify with St. Paul, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus, if we have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. He said, why, the very idea. We ought not to become wearied in our minds or even think of giving up. I mentioned our thought looking unto Jesus. You know, friend, if you begin to look at your problems, and begin to look at your battles and your circumstances like Peter, you'll begin to sink beneath the waves. Right, right, right. If you get your eyes off on people, I don't care how godly they may be. You know the very best among us. We have, we have enough humanity about us. If you put your eyes on us somewhere along the way, we're going to let you down. But I'll tell you, friend, if we'll keep our eyes on Jesus, thank God he'll make us more than conquerors and he'll help us always to triumph. He said, looking unto Jesus. You know, we hear some people testify and they say, oh, I want to be like Jesus. And we sing that old song, oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer. I'm sure we understand what people mean when they say, I want to be like Jesus. But you know, I'm not too sure that too many of us really want to be like Jesus. If so, friend, when do we want to be like Jesus? Oh, I know a lot of people want to be like him when he was going into Jerusalem, riding on that little donkey, and the people were trying to make him king. You remember they were waving palm granites 
not palm branches, but palm, palm branches. <laughs> if they'd have had any of those, I guess they would have raised, <laughs> waved them. <laughs> but they were waving palm branches, and they were crying, Hosanna in the highest. They were spreading their garments down before them, and they were crying, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They were, they were trying to make him king. The Bible says, And all the city was moved because of him. A lot of people want to be like him then. A lot of people want to be like him when he was performing miracles or doing something spectacular. And the Bible says his fame spread abroad throughout all the region around about Galilee. A lot of people want to be like him then. But you know, I was thinking, friend, I wonder how many of us want to be like him in his suffering. How many of us want to be like him when he was misunderstood? How many of us want to be like him when he was falsely accused? How many of us want to be like him when they sought to kill him? How many of us want to be like him when they hated him without a cause? I've often thought of the Apostle Paul's call to preach. You remember the Lord said to Ananias, But go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. That's quite a call to preach, isn't it? <laughs> Friend, could I ask you this afternoon, do you want to be like him when he was yonder in the Garden of Gethsemane? Suffering in, inter in intercessory prayer. Suffering to the extent that the Bible tells us his blood or his sweat became as great drops of blood falling down to the earth. Do we want to be like him when he was standing yonder in Pilate's judgment hall? No doubt with his hands tied behind his back. And they were accusing him. Do you want to be like him, friend, when he was standing there, guiltless? But they were declaring him guilty. Do you want to be like him when he was hanging yonder between heaven and earth on that old rugged tree? gradually giving up his life for the life of those who hated him. Friend, don't ever forget, Jesus said to his disciples, and he said to us, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. He said, if ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Our text for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. For consider him. Friend, leaving all else out, just consider a little bit of what they said about him this afternoon. And then maybe we won't feel so bad when they talk about us. Maybe we won't feel so bad when they laugh and scoff at us. 
or when they plot against us or when they seek to do us some physical harm. However, I want to say to us this afternoon, friend, there's not very many of us that ever suffer very much physical persecution. You know, about the only persecution you and I suffer in this country is a little mouth persecution. Or maybe a little persecution from the end of somebody's pen. Not too many of us can boast of any scars. Not too many of us can boast of any stonings. Not too many of us can boast of being in, put in prison for Jesus Christ. Not many of us can testify with the Apostle Paul, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. And really, friend, when you think about this matter of persecution, brother, I don't even like to feel like that I have ever in any way been persecuted. The Bible says of the early disciples that they returned from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name's sake. But their life had been threatened. And you know, we're living in a day when you hear so many people, well, you don't know how they're persecuting me. So many people just sort of have a persecution complex. I don't know at the times people have come to me and said, Doc, said, you don't know how they're persecuting me. When in reality, I didn't feel like it was persecution at all. <laughs> Friend, don't ever tra tell your troubles to somebody else. <laughs> you see, about half of them that you talk to feel like you, de you deserve them. And the, and the other half feel like you're getting what you need anyhow. They don't want to hear. Yeah. So don't ever tell your troubles to somebody else. You remember Brother Atwell telling about that lady that cooked those pies and put them on the table out there on the back porch to cool? And while those pies were cooling, the old hound dog out in the yard got a whiff of those pies, and he came sneaking up on the back porch, and just about the time he had his nose in one of those pies, the lady of the house happened to see him, and she came rushing with a broom, came down over his back with the broom, and he went leaping and jumping off the porch. Persecution! Persecution! But you know, in reality, friend, that wasn't persecution at all. He just had his nose in something he didn't have any business having it in. And brother, when I hear a lot of people crying, persecution, persecution, brother, it's really, it's really a lot of time not persecution at all. It's just the backlash of shipshod business dealings carelessness and sometimes a long tongue but friend leaving all else out just consider a little bit of what they said about him and I don't know maybe we can identify somewhere along the way you remember they said uh, this man blasphemy he's just a phony he says and claims to be the Son of God. But he's a blasphemer, just an old cuss. Now remember, friend, they weren't talking about you and I. They were talking about Jesus, the Son of God. They said, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. You remember... Jesus Christ said when John came on the scene, he said, they said, Behold, he hath a devil. He said, When John came, he came neither eating nor drinking, 
And they said, Behold, he hath a devil. But he said, The Son of Man came both eating and drinking. And they said, Behold, a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. You know, friends, some people have a critical heart. And really, it doesn't make any difference which direction you go. There's some people that are going to criticize. Now, I know there's such a thing as constructive criticism. And there are situations that we have to deal with sometimes behind a person's back. But I want to say to us this afternoon, friend, if you're criticizing your brother or your sister, and it, it brings real pain to your heart, then go ahead and criticize. But if you get the least pleasure out of it, then you, you, you better just keep your mouth shut. They said, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. I've often said, I'm sure glad he did. You see, friend, there was a time when I was just an old sinner. And one day I heard him knocking at my heart's door. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Yes, and I opened up the door and I said, Lord, come in. And friend, he came in. Amen. And he's been dwelling here. We've been having supper together ever since. They said he's beside himself. Or they said, uh, he's crazy, he's mad, he's a little off his rocker, he's got bats in the belfry, his bread's not quite done. Again, friend, I want to remind you, they weren't talking about you and I, they were talking about Jesus. That's right. That's right. They said, he hath a devil. He hath Beelzebub, the prince of devils. Now, friend, if that were so this afternoon, that would have made him the biggest devil of them all. They said, nay, but he deceiveth the people. You know why they made that statement? Friend, Jesus Christ wasn't deceiving the people. But you remember they said, hey, they said, this man can't be a true prophet. He doesn't practice. He doesn't hold to all of our traditions and all of our religious scruples. They said, nay, but he deceiveth the people. They said, we know that this man is a sinner. You know why they made that statement? because Jesus Christ had opened the eyes of a man born blind yes, sir. on the Sabbath day. And you remember those Jews, those Pharisees, they had so perverted the Sabbath day from that which the Lord ever intended it to be. Friend, they bypassed all of the fact that Jesus Christ had opened a man's eyes. They looked beyond the principle that was involved and they held to their tradition. They said, we know that this man is a sinner. Yes, they said, we found this man perverting the nation. Friend, he wasn't perverting the nation. He was converting the nation. It was those Pharisees that were failing to get the job done, but Jesus Christ was getting the job done. They had reduced religion to just a set of rules, to a state of legalism, but Jesus Christ came on the scene. He was offering mercy and pardon and forgiveness, and he was getting the job done. You remember they cried out, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works?
You know, I found out people will forgive you from almost anything on earth other than success. <laughs> the Bible says, and they were offended in him. They found fault. They murmured against him. They laughed him to scorn. They hated him without a cause. And I want to say to us this afternoon, friend, if we truly live godly in Christ Jesus, everybody's not going to love us. Everybody's not going to speak well of us. You say, well, Brother Newton, what am I going to do? You just, you just don't know what they said about me. You don't know how they've been talking about me. You just don't realize the lies that God have mercy on us this afternoon. What am I going to do? The Bible says, for consider him, for consider him, for consider him. I like what Brother Tony Anderson said. And I've heard different versions of this, but I'll give you the version I heard. As I understand, Brother Tony Anderson had just closed out a revival effort. And he had his overcoat on and his suitcase all packed. And he stepped out the parsonage door. And they had part of the front yard fenced in. Had a little fast dog in that fence. And Brother... Tony Anderson said as he stepped out the parsonage door, that little fast dog came rushing up against the fence and he began to bark. <laughs> Brother, if a dog barks at a mountain, will the mountain crumble? Brother Anderson said, I didn't take off my coat and sit down my suitcase and argue with that little fast dog. He said, I was on my way home to the best home on earth and to the sweetest little woman that ever lived. He said he walked to the end of the sidewalk and started down the street on the other side and the little fast dog came rushing over to the fence. He said, woof, 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 woof. Again, Brother Anderson said, I didn't sit down my suitcase and take my overcoat off and argue with that little fast dog. He said, I was on my way home to the best home on earth and the sweetest little woman that ever lived. Now I want to say to us this afternoon, friend, we're on our way home. We're going to meet our Savior one of these days. We're going to meet the one that redeemed us from a life of sin. And friend, there's a lot of sand ballots and Tobias that come around in this day in which we live. They don't like it because the wall is going up and the breach is being closed in. And they say, come on down. Come on down to the plain of Ono. We want to discuss the situation. We want to talk it over. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, friend. The work is too great. We can't afford to come down. But you know, friend, in spite of all that they said about him, there was something attractive. There was something magnetic about the Son of God. You remember the Bible says that old wicked Herod, that old wicked king heard about him and the many mighty works that he did. And the Bible says, and he desired to see him. There was Zacchaeus, the chief among the publicans. The Bible says he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. You remember the Greek said to Philip, Sir, we would see Jesus. A.W. Tozer used to make the statement, he said, no sermon is long when the preacher is showing me the beauty of Jesus. Pilate saw him and thoroughly examined him. He said, I find no fault 
in this man. The Jews marveled at him, saying, How knowest this man letters, having never learned? When the rulers of the people and elders of Israel saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned, they marveled at him and took knowledge of them. The Bible says that they had been with Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees were astonished at his doctrine because his word was with power. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Yes, sir. The common people heard him gladly and they glorified God saying that a great prophet is risen up among us and that God hath visited his people. You remember the Pharisees were sent to arrest him. But they came back without him saying, Never man spake like this man. Those two fellows on the road to Emmaus, they said, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the Scriptures? I thought about John over there in the first chapter of the book of Revelation. John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And by the way, friend, if you want to get a fresh glimpse of Jesus Christ, just crawl off somewhere and get in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. John said, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like undefined brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Listen, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. John said, and when I saw him, he said, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Brother, I thought about when Mary Virgin highly blessed among women. Virgin greatly favored of God. Virgin overshadowed by the power of the highest. Virgin by man never touched. Brother, when she went down into the mysterious land of motherhood in Bethlehem's barn, she came back holding in her arms cradling in her arms the eternal, the everlasting, the Son of God. Think about it, friend. The one that had created her, she had given birth to him. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, the blessed and only potentate. Someone said his every muscle was a pulley divinely swung. His every nerve divine handwriting. His every bone divine sculpture. His every heartbeat divine pulsation. His every voice a holy whisper. You see, friend, he was God's fault and God's plan, and God's will, and God's purpose, all wrapped up in mortality. 
No wonder the Apostle Paul exclaimed, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. I heard about a man that loved ants. And he would watch the ants as they crawled around upon the earth and made their burrows through the ground. And then he built some cages. And he put some earth and put those ants in those glass cages. And he would watch them as they made their tunnels and their burrows through the earth. And one day while he was watching those ants, he thought to himself, Oh, how I love you ants. I wish there was some way that I could let you know that I love you and that I would like to help you. I wish there was some way that I could communicate with you. Then he thought, but the only way that I could ever communicate with you and have fellowship and let you know that I love you and that I want to help you, the only way I'd have to become an ant myself. He said, but that's impossible. But aren't you glad this afternoon that with God all things are possible? Friend, someone said he came from the bosom of the Father to the bosom of a woman. He put on humanity that we might put on divinity. He became the Son of Man that we might become the sons of God. Amen. He came from heaven where the rivers never freeze, the winds never blow, the frost never chill the air. They never call for a doctor up there for no one is ever sick. No undertakers or graveyards are there for no one ever dies and no one is ever buried. He was born contrary to the laws of nature, conceived by the blessed Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. He lived in poverty, was reared in obscurity. Only once did he cross the boundary of the land and that was in childhood. He had no wealth, no prestige, and he made himself of no reputation. His relatives were inconspicuous and uninfluential. Yet in infancy, he startled a king. In boyhood, he puzzled the doctors. In manhood, he ruled the course of nature. He walked upon the billows and hushed the sea to sleep. He healed the multitudes without medicine and made no charge for his services. He never wrote a book, yet all the libraries in the land could not contain the books that could be written about him. He never wrote a song, yet he has furnished the theme for more songs than all songwriters combined. He never practiced medicine, yet he has healed more broken hearts than the doctors have healed broken bodies. He never marshaled an army, drafted a soldier, nor fired a gun, yet no leader ever made more volunteers who have under his orders made rebels stack arms and surrender without a shot being fired. He's the star of astronomy, the rock of geology, the lion and the lamb of zoology, the harmonizer of all discords and the healer of all diseases. Brother, great men have come and gone, yet he lives on. Herod could not kill him. Pilate could find no fault in him. Satan could not seduce him. Death could not destroy him. And the grave could not hold him. Up from the grave he arose <laughs> with a mighty triumph for his foes. He laid aside his purple robe for a peasant's gown. He was rich, and yet for our sakes he became poor. How poor? Ask Mary. Ask the wise men. Brother, he slept in another's manger. He cruised the lake in another's boat. He rode upon another man's donkey. Finally, he was buried in another man's tomb. Could I say to us this afternoon, friend, all have failed, but the ever-perfect one, he has never failed. He's the chief among 10,000. He's the one altogether lovely this afternoon. He's the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon and the bright and the morning star. 
He's bannered whole continents with love and changed the climate of nations. Brother, with no beating of drums and no blowing of clarions, he has unfolded and still holds the flag of victory above palace and slave market. His fame ever waxing, never waning, ever increasing, never decreasing is the most striking fact of our day. Born among cattle, dying between thieves, the light that began as a taper has waxed into the glory of noonday, and the, the voice that was but a whisper has become a thousand trumpets calling millions to his banners. Friend, in Jesus Christ, the silence of God breaks forth into full voice because what Jesus Christ did, God ever does. What Jesus Christ was, God is throughout all time, throughout all eternity, and to all mankind. Blind many gave sight, deaf many gave keen ears, dumb many gave new tongues, crippled many gave new limbs and supple muscles. Crazy men he restored to reason. Lepers he cleansed. The sick he healed. Outcast women he lifted up. Devils he cast out. Friend, aren't you glad this afternoon that God is no prisoner in his own universe? And I'm glad to tell us, thank God, he's bigger than your problem. He's bigger than my problem. Oh, friend, he's bigger than what's the matter. And there are no arms like his arms to reach out and welcome the prodigal back home to God. There are no arms like his arms to lift the fallen from shades of night to plains of light. And I want to say to you in closing, friend, if you're lost this afternoon, I'm glad to tell you that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Sometimes you may wonder what that is that's pursuing you, that that's hot on your tracks, that that causes you to break out and weep in the night hour. Oh, friend, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He's seeking you. If you want pardon and peace, I'm glad to tell you that if we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you want grace this afternoon, he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And friend, if you need more grace than you feel like you have, I'm glad the Bible tells us, but he giveth more grace. And then if you still need more grace, after that, the Bible says he has abundant grace. Right. Absolutely. And then, if you still feel that you need grace, the Bible says he's the God of all grace. I've often said, friend, it was grace, creative grace, that motivated God to create us. It was grace, foreseeing grace, that caused God to provide a wonderful salvation for our sinful soul. It was grace prevenient grace that caused God to pursue our wayward feet and convict us of our sins. It was grace, pardoning grace, that lifted us out of a horrible pit and set our feet upon the solid rock, Christ Jesus. It was grace, perfecting grace, that cleansed our heart of inbred sin and filled us with pure, sanctifying love. We would have to shout with the Apostle Paul, by the grace of God, we are what we are. 
My friend, if you're thirsty, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. If you're hungry, Jesus Christ said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Sometimes people say, oh, but preacher, I know you holiness people. You claim that you're satisfied, but you're always wanting more and more and more. Friend, that's true. <laughs> We're sort of like that little boy that loved bananas. So good until one day his mother said to him, Sonny, I hope you'll soon get satisfied with bananas. He looked up at her and said, Mama, I am satisfied. He said, that's why I want another one. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I want to say, friend, if you're dissatisfied, why don't you come to him who satisfies the longing soul and maketh fat the bones? If your old sinful garments are worn and threadbare, he'll take your old tattered garments and give you a robe pure and white. He said he would clothe you with the garments of salvation and cover you with a robe of righteousness. If you're lonesome, I'm glad to tell you he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. If you need a guide, he promised to guide you into all truth. If you need light, Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. If you want an entrance, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out. And find pasture. Yes, if you want rest, he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yes, Friend, if you want life, Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Amen. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. If you want security, this afternoon, friend, this is the best security I know about. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In fact, you won't find any insurance that can top this. We were over in the Bahamas with my brother a number of years ago. There was an old fellow that hadn't been saved too long, old brother Gray, that was up testifying and he was trying to express how wonderful it was to be a part of the family of God. He said, oh folk, he said, I want you to know I'm a part of a great insurance firm. He said, even the songwriter said, blessed insurance, Jesus is mine. <laughs> But, oh, friend, this is the best security, the best insurance I know about. For Jesus Christ promised to go before us. She said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. He promised to come behind us because he said, the God of Israel shall be your rear rearward, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. Then he promised to protect us on both sides. He said, by the arm of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. He promised to be above us. For he said, he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. He promised to be underneath because he said, underneath are the everlasting arms. And then, friend, thank God there's another side on which he promised to protect us, and that's on the inside. For he said, greater is he that is in you right, right. 
than he that is in the world. The best security that I know about. I'm glad to tell you this afternoon that Jesus Christ is our all and in all. And friend, if you have a need, he can meet that need that's in your heart and in your life. Looking unto Jesus. Would you stand with us? I want us to go from this service and be much in prayer. The service this evening that God will anoint Brother Keaton. The message of truth. And let's pray for a harvest of souls around the altar in the evening service. God, the Holy Ghost, will get through to us.